All right. Thank you, David and Nick, for joining me today in the podcast. And let me just introduce uh, introduce both of you to our audience. And obviously, we'll give you a chance to each one of you to share a little bit about your journey and, and your background. So for listeners and people who are watching it on the video, Nick is an architecture modernization consultant and author of the book, Architecture Modernization, which I'm super excited about. And David is chief product and technology officer at mobile.de, uh, which is part of Adavinta. And he has also contributed to the book, Architecture Modernization. So super excited to have both of you here today. Maybe we start with David, uh, if you can share a little bit about your journey, your background, and then we move to Nick. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having us. Um, as you said, I'm David, I'm leading product and tech for mobile.de, which is the leading car classifieds platform uh, in Germany. Uh, we've been around for some time uh, since 1996, and maybe this is already building the bridge to uh, a book that is uh, talking about architecture modernization. Um, so there's a, a little bit of history uh, related to that. Thank you, David. Nick, a little bit about yourselves. Sure thing. Um, so I got into tech around 15 years ago. I was lucky to have some good influences, companies doing continuous delivery and domain driven design. And somehow I ended up talking at meetups and writing blog posts. And that's how I fell into consulting kind of five years ago around that time. I was getting a lot of direct requests to work with companies directly. I run some workshops like event storming, for example. And uh, yeah, that just turned into enough to become a consultant. I was a bit unsure at first of how it would work out, but over the last five years or so, uh, it's been really enjoyable to work with different companies in different industries, get to model different domains and just see how different companies work. Fantastic. I really like, I think the combination for both of you to be here, obviously uh, the, the shared experience that you all have around the process of architecture modernization also, David, with your background on running this large organization, which has a lot of history and legacy. So I'm really happy that we got both of you and our time zones and calendars really came together. So I appreciate that. Maybe before we start on the topics, I really want to share maybe my first impressions of the book. I did get a chance to read through it. I have highlighted it, share parts of it to my colleagues and say, hey, check this out. I'm really enjoying that process so far. So when I read a book like this, I often get a feeling that wish I had this book 10 years ago and I get this feeling every chapter I read. So kudos to you, Nick, for really writing the book and David for contributing there. Uh, I'm already a fan and that's one of the reasons for me was super excited to have you today uh, as part of this conversation. Thank you. Uh, maybe we started talking about the book anyway. So maybe Nick, if you can give a little bit of insight on how was the process of writing the book and maybe the trigger for you that needs, there has to be a book on this topic? Yeah, sure. So I started the book during the pandemic. Um, you know, when the pandemic first started, we all had a lot more spare time. Before that, I used to travel a lot for work, go to a lot of conferences. Um, so even when I was working from home, I still had a lot of time that I would normally otherwise be spending. So um, I thought I might start writing a book. I'd written a book before um, in 2014. I co-authored a book and I thought it would be good to do that again at some point. Um, and the pandemic was kind of a trigger for, yeah, let's let's start writing a book. What would I write a book about? How would I describe the work I'm doing? And it usually fit into some kind of modernization. Yeah, so that was the trigger. Um I guess I felt the book was useful. I felt there was a, a reason for the book because whilst a lot of companies were modernizing their tech, moving to the cloud and um, you know modern infrastructure, there was a lot of question marks around all the other practices and ideas that go around that, like what order do you modernize things? How do you design a system using domain-driven design? So I focused on those bits that haven't been talked about so much before. Yeah, I'm glad that you had a chance to kind of pursue writing this book during the pandemic. 
um uh, i know we can almost run a separate podcast just on the process of writing because i had a conversation with manuel pais from team topologies and he he was telling me that you could almost run a separate conversation with me just the struggles and the pains of writing a book so appreciate you taking the time and maybe coming back to david how was your collaboration with nick on the book maybe giving a little bit of insights and background on that yeah first of all um maybe touching again on the history of mobile.de uh it's almost as old as i am uh not quite but um basically taking back to uh, uh my place in mobile uh is kind of a sweet spot because my father runs a car repair shop so i grew up between cars i uh, learned to love uh, technologies especially web technologies so uh, this is my place to be uh in a way so mobile is like 27 years old um have gone through uh obviously waves of technology changes um new devices came up um i mean when mobile was founded there there was no uh iphone android phones and so on and no apps um the business models changed uh we did internationalization walk that back um ownership of mobile changed a couple of times we bought companies we sold companies um over time um so a lot of these things uh happened over time um and obviously i was not around for the whole 27 years right um i'm a cpto for uh four years now um but still um in my role i see a lot of the history um the good and the bad um and uh together with my team um also have the real current question like what do we need to do to actually keep that platform healthy um and one of the key players at a certain point in time uh was Florian Stefan who introduced me to Nick when he was uh he was uh starting to write his book um and uh wanted to have like real life examples of how do you actually transfer what you can read about in a book to what actually happens in companies and uh, also to a certain extent see some success stories um and there our paths cross um and uh, so we worked together on like um finding out like what what kind of case study uh for mobile would be a good fit um to uh the chapters of his book fantastic i can obviously share a little bit of sentiment around it i think a lot of the concepts and ideas that the book has brought together are obviously not very new but how they have brought in all together to really put together a tapestry of the process is actually remarkable and what i really appreciate nick and also with david your contribution is it has examples i think every chapter has examples and often when you talk about these ideas people say it sounds great but who is doing it uh so i think that's where i think it hits the the nail on the head by really putting examples and i often tell companies and people I advise that there's a lot less of people talking about the challenges they face and only the good things are written but the bad parts or even the hard parts are missing in the ecosystem so i really enjoyed kind of going through the process not just re- uh, learning about and reading about the good things that happened but also the pains and the process that he had to go through so i think for me it was a really good collaboration i felt uh david in just reflected in the words and the message and the and the sentiment that came out of the book so appreciate that all right now i think i want to maybe in our pre recording session that we have few days ago i think we wanted to touch upon few topics for me the number one thing when i as a reader go through that content and also engage with these ideas is how do we work with our extended rest of the organization towards modernization because it's not going to be one person's effort so maybe starting with nick um often i have been in the situation maybe other leaders who come to an organization and obviously are um trying to make changes and you know asking to change things and working with the team and often face resistance when it comes to architecture modernization uh what has been your experience and journey while you were exploring this book and the ideas in the book especially for people who are coming into a new organization and trying to embrace these things for modernization so i think that's a good question 
I think very often in these modernization journeys that companies go on very often, either at the start or at some point to try and get things back on track, there's a change in personnel in a senior level, typically a CTO. I've, I've worked with a, a few examples of CTOs who are just starting out at a new company and they want some help getting things started. So that is quite a common scenario. In terms of how different CTOs or different companies handle that, I've seen different approaches. Um, I think, I think one approach is you come in and you bring in ideas that have worked for you at other companies before. Um, and that can work. Um, and there's kind of two sides to that. One side is, you know, people will be concerned that this new leader's coming in, they're bringing across some ideas that they've done before. They've not really understood our company and there's going to be some difficulty accepting those ideas. But I think on, on the other side of that, um, sometimes people are wanting something new and fresh and they want someone new to come in with ideas. So I think for a leader who's coming in with this responsibility, it's kind of difficult. And in the same company, you might get a mix of those people. Um, some people who are looking for something new and some people who are concerned about a new leader coming in and trying ideas that haven't been properly thought out in the context of this company. So I think it's a very difficult balance to get right. I think those are the two kind of extremes of that. Um, so I think a lot of it will be down to the individual, down to the company, but I do think there are some strategies that leaders can use. So if you're new to the company and you, you want to introduce new ideas, but you want to try and keep those people on site who might be a bit concerned, I think it's before you actually start throwing those, those ideas out there, taking some time to um, taking some time to understand why those changes can be useful and to show you're working out to the company. So if you're proposing some ideas, being able to explain why they make sense, being able to justify them um, and not just say, oh, domain driven design teams, apologies, here's some buzzwords, we're going to do those things. Sometimes, you know, having some buzzwords can get people excited. I'm not saying don't do that. Um, but for example, one of the common strategies I've seen working well is a, a leader who can come in and who can put the company's journey into perspective. So it might be the company's gone from a startup to a scale up. So that requires a different mindset. It doesn't mean what you've been doing before is wrong. It just means that now the company's changing. It's changing business model or it's changing size. It's scaling up requires a different mindset in certain areas. So that's one way of kind of gently introducing ideas. But I think being able to explain that story, not just saying we'll scale up, that was a startup, being able to get into the details and talk about the company's journey. Um, and if you can have someone who's been here as part of that ride, I think that's great. When I worked for one company, um, there was there was kind of a like a handover from the old to the new, like the old CTO, he said, I joined this company. I founded the company. Um, I was acting as a CTO, but I didn't really have a background in IT and programming. So I took the company as far as I could. And now I'm handing over to someone who can help the company take the next step. So yeah, the new leader comes in and gets some support from the previous people. I think that was a good example. Yeah, I really liked how you phrased it. I think it's almost like, what is the narrative that you're building for that change? How are you bringing people into that narrative? Uh, so buzzwords help, but without that narrative, these buzzwords will only take you so far. If I can kind of try to crystallize your sentiment and your points there. Yeah, I think it's subtle. I think sometimes you might not want to use the buzzwords Sometimes people might have heard some buzzwords in a previous effort that didn't work out. And they're like, oh, this time it's the same thing with some different buzzwords. So it's, it's one of those things where I think you need to spend some time talking to people, get a sense of 
where where people are at, what they've experienced before, and decide how much you want to use buzzwords and how much you want to maybe just focus on the company story and avoid using buzzwords. It's it's a difficult one to get right for sure. Absolutely, David. Maybe getting your input on that, especially have you have, having been seen the entire journey of your existing organization. For you, particularly for your journey, especially if you're advising new leaders who are kind of embracing the same situation, coming in with fresh ideas, hopefully with this book in their hand and, you know, uh, energized and excited about it, how would you see them being able to be successful there? First of all, uh, agreeing with what you crystallized uh, out of Nick's words. Um, uh, and I think you can actually refer it back to um, the kind of key skills as a leader, um, even as a technology leader, the one key and core skill you have to embrace is listening. Um, so if you come in, start and listen. Um, and at the same time, navigate um, the organization you joined. Um, you will figure out the key uh influencers uh in this network of people and i think it's um it's important to listen and understand like where is this company coming from and at what stage are you jo joining a company and at at a certain size the problems and also the solutions will be different right um and then um i guess when it comes to like generating this buy-in for this let's call it movement uh, because it's as big uh, as a movement, um, then I think it's it's very important to remember a couple of things um, that are key to generate buy-in and have people actually following through. Because I think the f the one thing is agreeing that yes, this makes sense and the uh, the tools, the methods uh, make sense, but it will increasingly get harder to actually put that in, in, in real motion and, and see results. Um, so first of all, I think uh, realizing that moderniz modernization is not just a technology exercise, uh, that it's actually a social activity um, to get this across. Um, and I think it starts with, uh, Nick said, like, uh, you have uh, domain-driven design workshops, you have uh, maybe event storming workshops and so on. Uh, you can't do that, or maybe you can, but the result will be a little bit different. Um, uh, you can't do that as a technology function alone. Um, you should do that with a cross-functional group coming together who really, like, holistically understands, like, what we're talking about in the specific domain or the business. So having this cross-pollination uh, in, in place and uh, also understand how things flow um, through system, through the organization, through the processes. Um, and then I think it's always, and I think this is uh, another key aspect of uh, being a technology and or product leader in a sense, um, um, answering the question like, what's in for me? Because in a way, uh, humans uh, have this question, no matter what change, what's in for me? Um, maybe sometimes it, it, it relates to what's in for the organization, but oftentimes it's also like what's in for me personally. And there are, the answers differ uh, based on what people you talk to. And I think generating buy-in in the sense of, hey, modernization just costs money, it costs time, it's an effort, right? Um, um, I think one a model that helped me uh, bringing that across um, is uh, the model of um, cost of change. Um, so versus functional excellence effort, which is kind of modernization in a way. So um, making people understand that uh, every time you add something to your platform, to your product, um, it actually adds cost of change because it adds complexity, um, to put it in simple terms. And if you just do that and do not care about modernization with reducing technical debt um, that you build up over time, um, 
looking what changed also from the outside in terms of technology changes and so on. And I touched on that earlier, what happens in 27 years, um, then you will end up getting slower and slower and slower as an organization. Um, so the cost of change will increase um, and you will reach that moment in time where you would like to add something, a new feature, uh, something that is really driving user value, but you can't, you can't move anymore. And showing that balance and make people understand there needs to be um, a conscious investment into functional excellence is, I think, one key concept that actually helped me bring that across um, with non-technical leaders uh, in a way. Um, and maybe the last uh, thing, um, there's no quick fix for that. Um, so there's not the silver or even golden bullet uh, to actually just make all your problems disappear. So it needs to be a conscious uh, invest over time. I really liked how you phrased the, the term like cost of change and maybe building on that and eager to hear what you think, David, and maybe also after that, Nick, often an inflection point, maybe a trigger point for that change happens when a new person arrives, like the example that we were talking about. But if you are in that state for an existing leader, would visualizing and maybe looking at cost of change and how that is changing over time could provide you signals that, okay, we cannot just keep on what we are doing. We need to maybe do this process of modernization, which will be significant because often people feel let's maybe do 5% more and that will solve the problem. But because they are in that system, it's very hard. And therefore a new person has to come in and say, Hey, I think it requires those, uh, modernization efforts, which we have not been thinking about. So how do you see that maybe David from your end, an existing leader who's already been in that situation, maybe part of the system, how do you recognize and leverage cost of change, almost visualizing that and also using it to communicate for such initiatives? Yeah. Um, in my specific example, and I used this, uh, this, uh, visualization a lot, uh, for a certain period of time. Um, I think there were two things that came together that were really helpful, to be honest. Um, the first thing was, um, <clears throat> back then we were still part of eBay. Um, and back then eBay decided, Hey, um, that what's mobile doing in Germany, that's cool. Um, but is this, um, something you can replicate to, to, um, other countries where we already have a presence, but basically. Uh, put something similar to uh, Mobile also in countries where we are already present. Um, and um, that came with the idea to build a global motors platform and not use uh, Mobile and uh, add the additional complexity of uh, all, all you need to do to actually internationalize, uh, but really uh, start a platform from a new. But um, at the same time, um, use the knowledge that is there in Mobile. Um, what that translated into was, hey, Mobile, can you please um, select like 30 to 40 people um, being uh, the core and root team of this new platform? Um, that left Mobile with uh, 30 to 40 people less um, uh, at one day in midst of a year um, with um, not changing like the ambitions and targets we had for Mobile. So what you ended up was um, you kind of had this balance between cost of change, function excellence, but it became uh, a, a pretty, pretty screwed from one day to the other. Um, and this was the point in time when I um, stepped into the head of technology role, uh, caring about functional excellence um, uh, in Mobile quite a lot. Um, and the realization was, okay, um, this is not how we can can go on because like uh, for one quarter we just followed through and just built all the new stuff and uh, even one quarter was enough to feel the first pains coming from that because like teams were overwhelmed because um, you had a kind of healthy um, artifacts per team or per person ratio uh, but if you remove just 40 people which was like uh, I don't know 20% of our teams um, this changes um, 
and this makes something with the teams, right? Um, so the other uh, interesting coincidence was um, we were tracking some of our efforts. Um, so we had um, kind of time tracking, not like batching in and out <laughs> at the start and end of your workday. That's not a, what I refer to. But teams kind of um, categorized their efforts in terms of like, this is security stuff, this is bug fixing, this we spend in actually modernization, this is actually like creating values for users um, and so on. And also like planned and unplanned work. And what you saw there from basically one day to the other is that there was a shift in that. Um, and um, the whole function excellence modernization piece was was dropping uh, because of like the focus we had on, on delivery in a way. Um, and this in combination enabled me to basically not only build up the theoretical story of cost of change versus functional excellence, but you actually had the data supporting that. And uh, you had the first uh, tangible impact of not investing enough in functional excellence. And then I think one remaining question was, okay, but what's the right ratio in terms of how much should you invest in functional excellence? And I think there's no right or wrong answer to that. Um, but uh, we had past data where we felt like platform health was okay-ish. Um, so we could say like this should be maybe a, a good indicator or, or minimum uh, you should invest. Um, so we actually pitched for that um, and uh, also shielded our teams. Um, so uh, we work with OKRs. So we said like um, this is like the, the, the bandwidth of like 20, 25% that is spent in function excellence. So please only uh, if you think about like value creation OKRs, only think about like 70% of the bandwidth. Um, and then the second thing we did back then, uh, we actually introduced something we call platform team. I think you could also architecture modernization enablement team or something like that um, to really like pull out people. Um, and this is really um, senior, um, you could call it architects, principal engineers in our case, who are taking care of cross-cutting services for the organization and also driving the uh, idea and what's to be done in terms of functional excellence uh, for us. So this all helped um, and uh, I think made it a bit simpler uh, because of this infliction point uh, that was, intru was introduced kind of externally um, to, uh, to really bring that a big step forward. Yeah, I like how you phrased it, like, maybe I'm paraphrasing it, like making this pain visible. You know, I think this is often that is not visible and then we are in the midst of it and then, then some we require an external input or trigger to kind of sense change. Uh, circling back on the same topic, maybe Nick, uh, from your side, uh, for existing leaders who are already part of the system, what would be your way of thinking about it, especially building upon what obviously David shared. Uh, if you are not the new person in the room and if you're an existing person, part of the problem, how would you see that? So I think, I think what David said firstly is kind of fundamental really. Um, some companies are good at explaining this, some companies aren't, but you know, as software systems get older, um, the more new features you add, the more new, the more complexity you add and the cost of change goes up. So that's kind of a universal truth about the world we work in. That's, that's going to be there. So companies that don't embrace this or when there are elite, when there are technology leaders that aren't able to communicate this, what tends to happen is it gets to a point where the business notices that, hey, you know, this is taking very long to implement simple features. Why do we have to touch 15 different microservices to implement a certain type of new feature? Or why is it taking three months to add two text boxes to a web page? And that's because the cost of change has just got out of control because there hasn't been enough focus on functional excellence. So 
I think the first bit, the first bit I would say is just having that narrative in your company, just making that fundamental truth visible to everyone. Whenever we build a new feature, there's a cost of maintaining that and it's going to slow us down in the future. When we build new stuff, it slows us down in the future and the way we build software can also slow us down. So I think just making that normal, just having some way to explain that. And uh, I would say if, if you're a leader and you don't have a way to explain that, I think David's example is probably one of the best I've seen. Functional excellence and cost of change, how, you know, that can prevent you getting to a situation where you've got a big modernization project. If you continuously invest in functional excellence and you're able to have some sense of your cost of change going up and down, then, you know, you can decide what's acceptable for your company and not get to that point where everything's taking a long time. People are angry. It's very stressful. You can, you can modernize continuously, might be 20% of your time, you know, controlled, stress-free. There might be some trade off sometimes about getting features out sooner, but it's, it's a much better than we're way behind. Everything's taking months. Um, it's, we need to get this done quickly. It's just, those are very stressful modernizations. And I think the second thing, a big space at the moment is, is really understanding systems better. So there's a tool called code scene, for example, it's a tool that can analyze systems. It can look at your version control history and it can give you some insights about which parts of the system are changing the most, where, which parts of your system contain the most bugs, where different parts of the system are changing together. And so a tool like that can, it can help you to understand your system, but it can also explain things in a way that is understood by people who might not work in the system. So I worked with a CTO recently. He was just coming into a company and he had some big decisions to make. Um, he was introducing some new ideas. Some of the ideas in the book, actually, I think that's why he contacted me because he recognized some things like domain driven design and team topologies were ideas he'd like to introduce. But the point of this um, story I wanted to share with you was he was able to use code scene and code scene identified something like, um, I think it was between 50 and 80% of the system that only contractors had knowledge of. So if the company let go of all the contractors, there would be, you know, somewhere 50 to 80% of the system that no one who was still there would actually have any experience of working on. So. Um, code scene recently took another round of funding, $7.5 million uh, or euros, I think. So, um, I'm a big fan of code scene and I, I, but I still think there's a lot of improvements in that area. So I think having the narrative is one thing, making it clear that when we build new stuff, there's a cost to that. And, you know, if, if we don't delete old features that aren't being used, if we don't, if we take shortcuts and introduce debt, that cost of change goes up, making that clear. And then I think using tools and other techniques to actually get insights and make it more quantifiable because I've worked with some companies where developers have tried to explain this. And uh, I spoke to a CEO and he said to me, all my developers have OCD. They're always talking about rewriting legacy systems and stuff. He didn't, he didn't grasp what they were trying to tell him. They weren't able to explain it in the language he understood. And he just didn't grasp this idea of cost of change, functional excellence. So they weren't talking the right language. They weren't able to build that narrative. And so they were desperately stuck in lots of legacy. And he was just like, I want them to deliver features faster. He didn't just, he just wasn't aware of that problem that existed. Thank you for sharing that. I think uh, interesting plug for code scene, obviously this is not sponsored, uh, but appreciate there's something that exists. I think, uh, getting that picture out. And as David said, you know, visualizing the cost of change and the making that pain visible is already helping to build narrative around that. And I think funningly in my head, uh, having read the book philosophy, philosophy of software design, it just feels like at certain point in time, technical leaders need to become software philosophers uh, with a pragmatic hat on it. Uh, but I think, uh, especially because you want to communicate change and a change is not specific for engineering. It's across the organization. So everybody 
it is to encompass all the needs and all the different type of uh, profiles and roles of people that you have. Nice segue to maybe the point that I wanted to uh, close in with both of you before we end the session is imagine having someone taking this book, reading it and super excited, whether an existing leader or maybe an engineer, maybe a product manager, any other roles. Maybe the first impression is, wow, this is lots. It looks daunting. Um, the points that are making the cost of change visible, building the narrative, understanding the story of your organization, I think which are the amazing points that both of you shared, looks great from a communication standpoint. But how do I start making progress? How do I not get overwhelmed by so many discrete different things that I need to think about and feel that, oh, this is just too much. I don't think I'm going to get there. I know you've touched upon this also in the strategy part of your book. I would love to maybe spend some time on that, maybe starting with Nick first, uh, especially around, I really liked how you phrase this point about creating a proposal to get to yes in our previous conversation. I really enjoyed that phrase. Uh, love to maybe hear more about it, and especially for people coming in and trying to get something done without just waiting and just endlessly overwhelmed by the by the concepts. Yeah, okay. So the idea you mentioned is an idea from one of my old colleagues. Um, it's an idea that I've always embraced myself, but I liked the way he framed it. And maybe his his version was a bit of an improvement over mine. But the I, the general concept is if you want to, I guess you could say do almost anything. If If you want to carry out some piece of work or introduce some new idea or get something started, and you require a decision from someone else, usually someone superior, you need some budget, you need to get your work prioritized over other work, uh, you need to get sign off on an idea. What my friend says is, and uh, his name's Joe Stead, by the way, I guess I should give Joe credit for his idea. Uh, what he says is, do as much as you can, so that when you put the idea in front of someone, all they have to do is say yes. If you overwhelm them with the problem too much, and give them too many options, they have to do a lot of thinking there. So do everything you can so that all they have to do is say yes. But to get to that point, you've got to cover with quite a few different angles. So I think the first one is uh, being able to communicate the business value of something. So you need to understand what's the company strategy, what areas would it be sensible to focus on from a business perspective? Um, and then I think a point that David made in our la last conversation, um, well, you don't want to give people too many options. Sometimes you can give people not options. It's good to show that you've actually considered the options. So you can say, this appears to be the top problem. We've explored these different ways of solving it, but this is the option that we think is the best for these reasons. So again, it's show you're working out, I think. So I think those would be the, um, that would be the first part. Yeah. Just try and put ideas in front of someone. So all they have to do is say yes. I will steal that. It's such a beautiful concept. Hopefully it doesn't become a hack that people apply everywhere, but I really, I, 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 I really like the, uh, the idea behind that is often when you expose too many options, again, the paradox of choice and overwhelming the other individual with information, then you will likely get pushback or ask for more information and just goes on and on. So just kind of bias towards action, helping yeah, to if, make me yes. I think that's a very smart way to do it. If I could just add one more thing as well. Um, the reason Joe mentioned that was because some other leaders they were kind of overwhelmed themselves. So whilst, whilst that's a good way of getting a decision made, the other person doesn't have to do much effort. Actually, it's a good way for you to get things in order. Like what are all the things I would need to do? Well, I could put something in front of the decision maker and they would say, yes, it's actually a, a useful tool for leaders themselves to think about how to manage all that complexity and what is it that I need to produce? And once you know what that looks like, you can start planning the steps you'll take to get there. Thank you, Nick. 
and maybe going to david uh i also remember this phrase of no regret moves uh when we were having a conversation outside this recording uh what would you advise for folks who are starting with this modernization especially finding it daunting because there's too many things um how do you uh help them think about it i mean uh first of all totally agreeing to the concept uh nick explained um and uh, this is something that i used to regularly or also like learned in consulting uh introduce context the problem option space and then end with a recommendation um so that uh, actually there's not too much room and uh it somehow relates to um to a quite a good book uh, in the UX design space that is called don't make me think um because this is essentially what you're doing um just uh relieve the person you're presenting to from all the pain of thinking and the mental uh, load and uh i think it makes your and the other person's life a little bit easier um so uh, regarding no regret moves um or how do you pick where to start um i think this is not an easy one uh but i think everyone who's with a company or with an a uh, uh set of systems for a bit of time has this kind of three to five things where you say like uh if someone asked me uh what are these things we actually should care about uh in terms of functional excellence you have this list already in mind um and um there are a couple of no regret moves where you say like um uh, if, if you look at uh, are these things in an area where actually where where your business core is and uh where also the future of your business is and where also maybe the money is earned i think this you can actually look at uh, as a no regret move to start there um and one thing that's key for that especially for the for the future of the business question is is there actually a business strategy uh, telling you where the future of the business is if you're not actively involved in 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 crafting the strategy for the for the business um what helped in our case uh, was also creating transparency um for yourself but also then again for the communication part um so we started with kind of the um the list of technical debt um maybe even one step further uh, before that um we defined what is legacy and what is actual technical debt um so our definition was okay there's legacy this is kind of naturally if if things get a little bit older uh but the subset of legacy that actually becomes a problem this is what we call technical debt and we created a whole list of stuff that was qualifying to be technical debt um and just put rough t-shirt sizes in um and kind of a priority and then uh we said okay what's the leanest process you can put in place um to actually uh kind of move things forward uh and this was just um we used fibonacci numbers uh together with the t-shirt sizes put them in uh, and said like we commit to uh basically get rid of x percent of this list um within one year and we set that as our okrs and also were able to put that into the okrs of the of the business um so that there was actually commitment in doing so um and this kind of combines the idea of um starting where there's really benefit uh and where it also hurts the most in the uh, in the day to day um and also giving a little bit of structure um without over complicating it too much and another um idea is like uh if if your systems and business is already structured in kind of domains then pick one where you actually start and not try to do an event storming session for the whole of mobile for the whole of 27 years um in in one go um because um this will be an overload i guess and we're spending all the time just doing event storming all right i think we are wrapping up um 
how do we get different people who may be interested again from this podcast but also maybe looking to acquire this information and getting hold of this maybe engage with you uh, maybe nick starting with you what would be the right place for them to reach out to you and talk to you about this uh so i guess the the best option would be if you're based in london or you're visiting london i host the dd london meetup so if you want to come to the meetup hang out in person or if you want to give a talk at the meetup that would be awesome always happy to have people who are guests in town doing a talk um doesn't have to be about domain driven design it can be about anything software development architecture leadership related we're quite flexible so that's one way to keep in touch uh, if that's not possible um i attend quite a few conferences um so you can follow me on linkedin and stuff and i'm happy to chat on linkedin too thank you nick and david how about you what would be the right uh, medium to get a, get to a, uh, reach out to you in case you have questions and maybe ideas to talk about Yep. Uh, I think the easiest way, follow me on LinkedIn and drop me a message. Amazing. Again, thank you so much, David and Nick. I know we just maybe touched the very top of the iceberg of architecture modernization. And uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk again as uh, more people start looking at this topic, also engaging with the book. Uh, I'm already excited with what I'm hearing from the people who have got the book they are reading it and uh, some people prefer the paper version they're waiting for the paper version i know that's coming soon uh so do you nick do you have any timelines to share on that with the group uh so the book's currently in the copy editing process i've i've gone through eight of the chapters that the copy editor has corrected so i think we're still on target for like end of october so end of october it is all right. Thank you again, David and Nick. Um, hopefully, we'll get a round two uh, soon when you are in the uh, when you want to talk more about the ideas and you're hearing more in the community about it. And uh, there's always going to be lots to talk about this topic. And really appreciate the time that both of you give today. Likewise, thank you. Thank you for having us.